Uh, okay, so um, second part on computational social choice. I think I want to start by asking whether there's anything from yesterday that anyone has any questions about that I can spend two minutes explaining again. <laughs> there you will find the slides, but apparently there's also another website where you also find the slides, just in case. <clears throat> So what did we do yesterday, right? It was an introduction to voting, to voting theory. Um, we uh, started by seeing some examples for voting rules. So anyone remember any names of any of the rules that we saw? No, of the rules, the voting rules. Border, for example, somebody says, plurality. The value of runoff, yes, the, the, the thing with the tree, exactly. Yes, okay, so we saw some rules. So these were all, uh, mathematically speaking, these were functions that took as input one ranking over all the alternatives from each voter. And they returned as output, ideally a single alternative that wins the election, but we also saw it could happen there, that there's a tie and that maybe several of the alternatives are equally good according to this voting rule. So these were the rules. These are were the most basic objects that we talked about. And then we talked about um, what's good or bad about specific rules. And um, very briefly, we talked about complexity and very briefly about this epistemic perspective. But the main topic was the axiomatic method. So we used axioms to talk about the properties of rules and whether they are good or bad in terms of these, these axioms. So these axioms were um, yesterday only semi-formal encodings of properties that we should care about for voting rule, often related to things like fairness, but, but not only. So some examples for axioms that we saw, any names that anyone remembers? Neutrality, Neutrality yes, very good. And anonymity, yes. yes. Positive something, responsiveness, yes. <laughs> yeah, so there were a few of those. And uh, then we saw um, very basic results that were of the kind oh, look, this specific voting rule does not satisfy this specific axiom, so maybe there's a problem. Uh, I think I, I didn't really have specific sites for this, but I occasionally, I think, mentioned like also positive, the positive side, look, this voting rule does satisfy this axiom. So um, all of them, I think, that I showed you yesterday satisfies anonymity, for example. So in that respect, they were all good, um, but, some, but they all kind of failed some other axiom that we mentioned, more or less. So these were like very, very basic insights to relate the rules and their properties, the axioms. But then we also saw a couple of serious theorems and two very classical theorems. And for one, we even saw a proof. And one was an example for a characterization theorem. And the other one was an example for the impossibility theorem. So which one was the characterization theorem? What's the name of the person that it is called? May, May exactly. So this was May's theorem that said, in the special situation where we only have two alternatives, the only rule that is anonymous, neutral, and positively responsive is this simple majority rule. So then we have a clear characterization. If you care about this, this, and this axiom, you must use this rule. There's no other way. So this was a, I would say, a positive result in the sense that we saw, oh, this intuitively appealing rule actually also has nice formal properties. And these nice formal properties give us very clear instructions about how we should run elections. There's no more questions to be asked once you accept these axioms. So it kind of simplifies our life. Uh, so I think these are good things. Um, it was only for the special case of two alternatives. So it doesn't really tell us a lot about many other real world scenarios that we care about. At least for these simple scenarios, it gave us a very clear message of what's, what's the right way of doing things. So that's good. And what was the impossibility theorem? Yeah, so first the name, the really hard part of the question. Yes, Gibbard was one name and the other one was Southwest Wade. Yeah, so these were two people that independently from each other in the early 70s proved this result that said, if I want a voting rule that is resolute, so that always returns a single winner, that is subjective, so that doesn't from the outset exclude some from alternatives from winning altogether, so every alternative can sometimes win. And that is strategy proof. I think I didn't have that word on the slides yesterday, but I will have today. So that cannot be manipulated where nobody can ever take advantage of the rule by lying about their preference and get a better outcome. 
the only way of doing this is to implement a dictatorship. And so if we say dictatorships, obviously we don't want, then it becomes an impossibility result by saying it's impossible to have a good rule that is subjective, uh, resolute, strategy-proof, and non-dictatorial. And that one we didn't prove, and it's quite complicated. And we're going to go back to that result today. OK. Um, so yesterday, we talked about voting rules and axioms, very classic introduction to social choice theory. That's what you always certainly should hear uh, at the beginning when you learn about social choice theory. Um, I mentioned a couple of things with a computational flavor, but not really very much yesterday. And so today, we want to really go into modern computational social choice, where we it really has something to do with computers, um, even quite practically today, uh, a little bit. Uh, so two topics I want to talk about. The first one is automated reasoning for social choice. So that's the basic idea that we would like to use computers to help us do some of the work that we yesterday did by hand, so to speak. Right. So how can we use computers to support us to better understand how voting works, to do some of the work that traditionally has been done by economists, mostly it was economists who proved these classical theorems, can we help them? Can we get new theorems like this? Can we get a deeper understanding? Can we use computers for this? And the specific technique that we are going to use um, are SAT solvers, so satisfiability solvers. Very quick question, who knows what SAT is? OK, excellent. Much better than I expected. So, and I will explain it anyway in a moment uh, when we get there. And then the second topic I want to talk about is explainability in social choice. So that's the idea. OK, you can use a voting rule. Obviously, you can use the border rule, let's say, to run your election. You get an outcome. But then you show this outcome to people. And so why should they accept this? OK, if it says in the Constitution, you must use border. And if you have like a record of how everybody voted, you can count yourself. You can say, OK, it read, the numbers really add up. And the law says it should be border. So I have to accept this. But I still don't really understand why that's the good solution. And so what I want to talk about is how can we really explain to people why is this a good outcome, not by referring to some abstract voting rule that's somewhere on the books, but by directly talking about the axioms, about these nice properties that intuitively say something about what is the right way of taking decisions. And it's connected to the first topic because we're also, one approach at least is to also use these SAT solvers. All right. Um, so yesterday we got away without really ever defining our object of study very formally, or I think at all. It was very clear, I think, what the voting rule is, but I never put a definition on the slides. Today, we have to be a little bit more formal, so I want to put this definition on the slide. So we have a finite set of alternatives, big X, and uh, sometimes the number will be important, so it will be M alternatives. And L of X is going to be the set of all strict linear orders on X, so all rankings, as I called them most of the time yesterday. And we're going to use these strict rankings to model preferences of people. To be precise, because we're going to talk about this gibbard satisfied theorem where people manipulate, we're going to use these strict linear orders for two mathematically equivalent but conceptually very different things. The one thing are the true preferences that people have in their mind. We assume they are strict linear orders. And the other thing are the ballots that they're going to submit to the voting rule. And they're also strict linear orders of the alternatives. And if somebody is telling the truth, these two things are the same. And if they're lying, they are a bit different, but they are still both strict linear orders. Yeah? So this L of X is the set of all strict linear orders. Then we have some voters or agents. We use the numbers from 1 to N to uh, refer to them. And big N is the set of all of them. And each of them gives us one of these strict linear orders. And the one that is given to us by voter I, I'm going to refer to as R, R subscript I. So this will be the ballot submitted by voter I. And if everybody submits a ballot, we get such a vector from R1 to Rn. And bold R is this vector. And this is what we call the profile of submitted preferences. So the input to our election is such a profile uh, of what people say their preferences are. And then a voting rule. And today, I will only talk about resolute voting rules, except very briefly in the exercise at the bottom of this slide. A voting rule is then a function that takes as input a profile. So an element of set of all strict linear orders to the power of n and returns a single winning alternative because it's resolute, a single one. <laughs> Exercise. How would you change this definition to 
also be able to talk about irresolute rules where there might be some ties between two or more alternatives. How would you have to rewrite this one line of mathematics there near the bottom of the slide to do that? How many people would be able to tell me? All right, then we're going to go with the first one. You can return a set. Maybe a non set. Yeah, so I'm going to put here, I'm going to replace x by the power set of x, the set of all sets, and then minus, set minus the set of the empty set. So I'm not going to allow the empty set out outcome. So it will be a function that takes linear orders from everyone. And then the nice notation for power set is this. So this is the set of all subsets of x but the only one that we're not allowing is the empty set. So that would be a, a way of defining what a voting rule is more generally, but today we are gonna be happy with this simple definition uh, because <clears throat> that's the only thing we're gonna really talk about. Uh, I should use this. Okay, um, so now that we have a formal model of what voting is and what voting rules are, we can also formalize our axioms that yesterday I had kind of defined like this. I have here for three of them, uh, how you would do that. And it's not very difficult to do it for all of those that we've seen uh, yesterday. So Pareto, let's start with that one. I'm gonna use this notation here. What I mean by this, this is the, so big N was the set of all voters. So this complicated looking thing that the second half of the room can't even read probably. This is the set of all voters <clears throat> who in profile R say that X is better than Y. Right, so there are some people who say X is better than Y, some people maybe who say Y is better than X. This is the set of all of the first few who say X is better than Y. And then I can formalize Pareto by saying that a voting rule F satisfies the Pareto principle if the following is the case. For all profiles, for all X's, for all Y's, if the set of supporters of X over Y is actually everyone, then Y cannot be, out be the outcome of the voting rule. So the voting rule is a function applied to the profile. It returns some winning alternative where it can't be Y if everybody says X is better than Y. That would be a way of formalizing Pareto. The next one is this immunity to strategic manipulation or strategy proofness, as I want to call it today, or incentive compatibility is another word that I don't use on the slides, but means the same thing. We say that a rule F is strategy proof. First, informally, we say it's strategy proof if for no voter, it can ever happen that she finds herself in a situation, so in a profile where the other people vote somehow and she is about to vote truthfully. And that would give her a worse outcome than if she were to change her ballot and lie and submit, submit that to the voting rule instead. And a worse outcome in terms of her truthful preference. So she's not gonna change her preference in her mind, the preference in her mind, she will use to assess what outcome is better or worse. But the one she ships to the voting rule, she can say anything she likes, as long as it's a linear order. So a bit more formally, we say that F is strategy proof if there exists no voter I for which there is a profile R, which we think of as everybody's reported preference and her own truthful preference RI. And also, uh, another ranking ri prime which we think of the lie of this agent the untruthful ballot such that and now we're going to use some other notation that's defined at the bottom of the slide so this is the outcome of the voting rule if she votes truthfully and this is the outcome of the voting rule if everybody votes as they did before and she changes her ballot to ri prime and if that outcome for the lie is ranked above the truthful outcome according to her truthful preference, then something bad happens. So that's why there's this no underlined here. So none of this bad stuff should ever happen. If none of this bad stuff ever happens, then we have a strategy proof rule. Is that definition clear? It's gonna be very important for a good part of the lecture today. Yes, please. So it's only for one of the yeah, so we are only interested here today in a single agent deviating. Uh, of course, in uh, realistically, we also care maybe about a, a small group deviating, and that's only going to be more difficult to achieve. So we're going to prove a negative result about this. So if it's already falls apart, if single people might cheat, 
it's certainly going to fall apart if groups of people might cheat. So we're not even going to bother thinking about this today. But in other contexts, it can be very interesting to do that, just not for the result I want to present here. All right. Uh, and then the last one, this uh, subjectivity, which says any any alternative is could be the outcome for a certain profile. It says that for every alternative, there exists a profile such that if I apply the rule to the profile, I get that, that outcome. And intuitively, for example, it could be like if everybody wants X, has X at the top, any reasonable rule should elect it. This is even weaker than that. It might say, oh, in that case, we're still going to elect Y. But in some other case, there is some case where we elect X. So it's, a, it's the weakest possible thing that people have been able to think of to say, OK, you shouldn't exclude some outcome from the from the outset. You had a question. Yes, so like we start here, so when you get to this. So it's true that if a rule is neutral, it should be subjective. So that could explain. Yes. The yes, today. you're right. So neutrality implies subjectivity, but I would say neutrality is a stronger yeah. logical constraint. So that's it, it's the weaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could replace in the theorem subjectivity by neutrality, and it would look would be a very nice theorem as well, but it would be technically a mathematically weaker result. Yes. Uh, why does subjectivity imply that one win a priori? Why each should each win instead and one loss a priori? Um, so I would like um, I would like nobody to be excluded a priori. So I would like so it's the same as saying everybody has some chance of winning. And that's what this says. Every X has the chance of winning because there at least exists at least one profile that makes it win. Yeah, no one loses a priori. Yes. Uh, no one. Yeah. OK. Um, I said excluded from winning is the same as. Yeah, I think we mean the same thing. Yes. Yeah. How can we know that an agent is cheating by opening up their, their mind and having a look inside? So we can't. So we can't. Okay, I understand the question. Yeah, very good question. So, um, indeed, if somebody is cheating, we might never know. Let's say we are the people who, you know, say oh, tomorrow we're going to use the border rule, and you know we are affected by the outcome. So we would like to make sure everything is done properly. We will never know whether somebody cheated, but if we have a rule for which we can prove that it's strategy proof, so which has this nice property then we know it would have never been in somebody's interest to cheat. So we can, we might, they might still be crazy and still cheat, even if it's bad for themselves. But then, you know, if we assume they are rational, then we do kind of know they cannot have cheated because it would have been bad for them. And as long as, well, I think it should be strategy proof and we should be able to explain to people it's strategy proof. Say, look, here's the proof that says you can never benefit from cheating. So please don't. And then we could hope that they follow that advice. Yes. All right. So here's the theorem again. I formulated it slightly differently, but it's the same thing as yesterday. So also maybe I should define what uh, it means for a rule to be dictatorial. So it, a rule is dictatorial if there exists a dictator, one of the voters, call her I here such that for every profile R, the outcome of the rule applied to R is the top element of the ranking submitted by the dictator. Then I call it dictatorial. And if it's not such a rule, I call it non-dictatorial. So quick exercise. How many different voting rules are there that are dictatorial? Right. So dictatorial here, I've used it as an adjective. So it's a, a rule might or might not be dictatorial. Please count them. How many are there? So who, who thinks they have a number in mind? Yes, in the very back, please. N, yes, I think it's the right answer. So why is it N? Yeah, so every, every voter could be the dictator. So there's the dictatorship of the first voter. It's one rule. There's the dictatorship of the second voter. It's another rule. And there's the dictatorship of the last voter, that's the N rule. So the N, this, this is a family of N rules, N really very terribly bad rules, but still N different rules. So the theorem says, 
there exists no voting rule for three or more alternatives that is resolute, that is, so always returns a single winner, that is subjective, everyone has a chance of winning, that is strategy proof, nobody has an incentive to lie, and that is non-dictatorial, nobody's a dictator. There exists no rule with, uh, that has all of these very reasonable properties. So let's try to understand a little bit. So first of all, I know when I present this kind of stuff, there's usually half of the room misunderstands a little bit what dictatorship means, what dictatorial means, and they tend to think, oh, it's, that's not really dictatorship, how we use the word in the real world. The formal definition is not as bad as a real dictatorship. And that's a misunderstanding. And I just want to clarify this. So it does not mean the following. It does not mean that for every profile, the outcome is the top alternative of one of the voters. That's not the same thing. The quantifiers, I've moved them around, right? That's not the same thing. That's what I call here a local dictatorship. That's a, a restriction, but not a crazy restriction. So it's not, if I, if I first run the election and look at the outcome and say, oh, you, this was your top alternative, so you were the dictator. That person is not really a dictator. They maybe dictated the outcome in this profile, but if we go to another profile, they might not dictate it anymore. So they're not a dictator in this sense. So in this sense, it's like the universe gets created, people get put on earth, somebody gets told you are a dictator, and from now on, every election that we run, whatever preferences people have on whatever topic, it's always that person's uh, top alternative that wins. So that's a much, much, much stronger thing than just, oh, it so happens to be somebody's top alternative. I mean, being somebody's top alternative when there are three alternatives and 100 voters, it's always going to happen. It's not a restriction at all. There's almost no restriction at all. So that should be important. That's important. <laughs> Next bullet point. The theorem does not hold for two alternatives. That's why this is in there. Can somebody tell me why? Why does this, why is this not actually true for two alternatives? So what would you have to do to this, if I had forgotten the condition, what would you have to do to disprove the theorem for the case of two alternatives? You would have to find a rule that has all of the nice properties. So can you find a rule that has all of the nice properties for two alternatives? Do we know any nice rules for two alternatives? The simple majority rule, yes. So why is the simple majority rule, why is it good? It's subjective, yes. Both alternatives can sometimes win, certainly true. It's non-dictatorial, right? Not one agent always determines the outcome. It depends on the majority. And it's strategy proof. And that one you have to think about a little bit more. So if there are just two alternatives, I can never damage my own interests by not voting for the one that I like more between the two. I should, most of the time it doesn't matter what I say, but if it ever matters, I should say the true thing to get what I want. And the theorem is true for exactly one voter, but not very interesting. So why is it true for one voter? Yes? But, uh, we do, we do Exactly. So it's kind of a dictator without being, you know, their own fault, if you like. So if, if it's strategy proof for one voter, the only way to make it strategy proof for one voter is to do what she wants. Well, then she's also the dictator of this very small society. So that's an uninteresting special case that we can't use for anything. So the smallest interesting case is exactly three alternatives and exactly uh, and um, exactly two voters. I didn't write that on the slide explicitly. So if there's just one voter, also nothing interesting happens. So this would be the critical case that we should maybe try to understand first if you want to understand the theorem and that's also how we're going to do it. There was still a question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Most um, rules, voting rules that are used don't have this strategy proof. But are there rules that for uh, some common rules that have the dictatorship problem? Or they really want to avoid that as possible? I would say the, the dictatorship property in this sense is, I mean, I think that's really just actual dictatorships. I don't think there are any rules that under the guise of a more reasonable voting will somehow happen to be dictatorial. If it's combined with some randomness, which we're not going to deal with at all in this tutorial, then yes, so there is random dictatorships that can be somewhat reasonable in some circumstances, but I'm not talking about this at all here today. So, but just for people who have heard about this, but no. So I would say the answer to your question is no. All right. Um, so now, if you want to prove this theorem, right, it's a very important theorem. Let me talk, tell you a little bit about the history of this result. So 
people, I would say for centuries, it's not an overstatement here, have tried to design a strategy proof voting rule. They didn't maybe have the vocabulary that we have today, today to say exactly what they mean, but this was something that certainly in the 18th century for sure, and I, I would say even before that, people have thought about what would be a good rule that would make sure that it's in everybody's interest to just say what they really want and take a simple decision. So people have thought about this. So um, Borda and Condorcet, a little over 200 years ago, they were also fighting over these kind of things when they had different ideas about how you should run elections. Neither of them had a proposal for making it work, but these were things that were in the debate. Then uh, in 1951 was the PhD thesis and the first paper a couple of years earlier by Arrow, who got the Nobel Prize in, in, in economics 20 years later. It was a huge uh, result. Another kind of impossibility theorem I'm not going to define here was somewhat similar with a different set of axioms saying, well, you can't have a voting rule that is nice in this sense. It had a huge impact on across economics. And so people, a lot of smart people really started working on these kind of things. And uh, the strategy proof issues, strategy proofness issue was, I think, one of the main things that people cared about. So they were really trying to get a formal argument why nobody managed to come up with a strategy proof rule. And they really tried. And the Gibbard Satterthwaite theorem, right, the two people, they proved it independently in the early 70s. So it took 20 years to get a result. And what that means is not that the proof, as, as, right, it's not that somebody wrote down the theorem and then they tried for 20 years to find the proof. It's not quite like this. But the hard part of proving a theorem is usually formulating the theorem in the first place, right? So uh, you have to figure out in your mind, what do I actually want to say? So for example, you maybe you forget the subjectivity there and then it's not true anymore, but it might be quite hard to see that when you're attempting to prove it or how do we formalize strategy proof is exactly, right? This formal definition was not around uh, for much before that. And there were maybe slight variants that you could do or to realize that it works for resolute rules, but it wouldn't work exactly like this for irresolute rules. It took another 20 years to prove a variant of this for irresolute rules. So just figuring out what you actually want to say is really difficult. And once you know what you want to say, it's still not easy to actually prove it if nobody has done like something like this before. Also, now we understand that Arrow theorem and the gibbard satterthwaite theorem are very closely related and you can prove one as the corollary of the other in either direction as you like with relatively little additional work. But the problem is that Arrow's theorem was correct, but his proof was complete garbage. It was, it was wrong. He didn't even use all the conditions and it was just kind of written in nice prose and half of it was missing. He had, so he was a genius, he had the right idea, but he was not a proper mathematician who was able to write down these things, how they should be written down. So this also took years for other people to fix these little mistakes and uh, come up with a correct proof and much longer come up with a readable proof. So also the Gibbard and Satterthwaite theorem papers, they are correct, but it's not fun to read them, right? So the, the theorems, you it's very hard to understand the proofs if you read them in the original. And then, you know, in the 90s, people started publishing, you know, here's my two-page proof of one of these theorems, and here's another one. And so then it really started to become something that you, for example, when, when I teach this in Amsterdam, I don't have time for this to, uh, now, but then I do do full proofs of these theorems uh, you know, on the board and on slides, and I can do it in an hour, let's say. But this was not possible um, 20 years ago. I would say we didn't know exactly, we didn't know well enough how to do this nicely. So it's really difficult. The gibbard satterthwaite theorem is correct. There are pretty proofs. One of them is in this paper by myself at the bottom there, not my proof, but just a, a nice write-up of, of the proof idea by other people. And, uh, but what if tomorrow you want to prove a new theorem? Uh, and you're not, and, you know, if you know this is the really important theorem, I want to prove it, it's fine to invest half a year to figure it out. But if you have like 10 ideas, what might be a good theorem, what not, you're not really sure yet about the definitions exactly, you would like to spend three days on it to get a good idea whether it's okay or not. And then you would like to move on to the next thing. And, you know, because half of your ideas, you will turn out to be wrong. So you, you, you don't want to spend half a year on, on proving something like this. So that's very, very difficult still. So we need better methodology to help people to understand these things, to quickly check intuitions, conjectures. You know, what if I change the definition a little bit? Is it still impossible? Wouldn't that be a nice strengthening or variant of the result? And, it's not worth to sit down half a year for that, but maybe it's worth to invest a week into that. So can we support scientists to do that? That's kind of the, um, the thing I, I'm after here. 
So we need a much better methodology to reason about social choice and maybe tools from AI can help in particular of automated reasoning, which is like one of these old dreams of, of artificial intelligence. You feed the computer with some description of a mathematical problem and it comes back the next day and say, here's the argument why this is true or here's the argument why this is false. That would be wonderful. This has worked in a few special cases. So there are very famous examples like the four color theorem from the 1970s. Maybe you heard about it. Uh, and and other things. And it turns out that social choice theory and related fields, also game theory, I think also this applies, they're quite suitable uh, to this approach. And in the last decade or something like this, uh, people have started doing that and have managed to get some interesting results. So first, most basic kind of result is just to verify an existing theorem. So we have this theorem, like keep it satisfied. I would like to get a new proof just to be extra sure that it's correct or just to understand it better why this is correct. This is a perfectly uh, valuable thing to do, at least if it's an important theorem. Yes, question. Well, I would say for the four color theorem, it's it's debatable whether this, I think most people nowadays accept this as a proof, but it's still debatable because it's a huge, uh, it has improved a lot. I think it's not as terrible as it was in the 70s, so it maybe now it's more feasible. So I will talk about this, whether or not we should accept these as proofs at the end when I explain to you how we do it. So we'll get back to you. I think it's a very, it's a very important objection uh, and there's some merit to it, but I think also very good answers. But I, I, I can explain that better when we've seen how we do it. So we can verify existing results if you want to have extra assurance that they're correct, if you want to do a new proof, whatever. Um, but so we yeah we we might do proofs of entirely new theorems so i have an idea for a theorem uh, i'm not able to prove it by hand maybe the computer can help me and i might even to do discovery of new theorems so i don't know exactly what theorem i want but i have a list of axioms and i just feed the computer and say try all combinations see if you find something interesting and this also has worked in a couple of cases so this is the most demanding one uh, where then it just spits out theorems one after the other and some would be not very interesting but some might be quite interesting um, so this is the original paper uh, proposing the idea and they did it for, so Tang and Linda did it for Arrow's theorem and uh, Pin Song Tang and his PhD also did it for Gibbard Satisfied, but it's not in a published paper and a couple of other less important results. And this is a survey tutorial paper that explains the methodology by um, Christian Geist and Dominic Peters. Okay. Um, Let's have a look. So the outline of the approach for the gibbard satisfied theorem, this is the one I want to explain it for you to you for. We're going to look at the first non-trivial case, which is the one with two agents and three alternatives. We want to understand what's going on there. Uh, and the idea is that if we can prove the impossibility for that case, the impossibility for the general case will be, let's say, unsurprising. It will not be formally established yet, but it will be unsurprising, right? So the more alternatives, the more voters you have, the harder it will be to find a good voting rule. So the first non-trivial case is really the one that is the essence of the result. Um, so that's the one we want to do with the computer. And the basic approach is that we try to write in logic an expression that says, uh, something like there exists a voting rule that has this and this and this and this property, and the properties are the axioms. And then we feed this formula into a satisfiability solver, which is a program that can tell you for any given formula whether it's satisfiable or not, so whether there exists a way of making it true or not. And if that thing says, no, I can't make this formula true, it's not satisfiable, then we know that the, the supposed negation of the theorem that we wrote in logic is actually incorrect. And then we have the uh, impossibility established. Um, and so we're going to use propositional logic to do that, Boolean logic. So uh, people who haven't done this for the last few years, they get confused about the name. So that's the very basic logic that you've all seen in your first year at university. It's the one with the truth tables, where you can say P and Q implies R, this kind of thing. So that's the most basic logic 
uh, that we're going to need. And such solvers are these programs that you can give such a formula to, and it says either, yes, this is a satisfiable formula. So there is a way of giving truth values to the variables so that the formula becomes true. Or no, this is not possible. It's an unsatisfiable formula. And in this case, we are hoping for it to say unsatisfiable. Then it would confirm the impossibility of the theorem. Yes. It is uh, so far uh, to 90% used for impossibility results. And I will talk a little bit at the end uh, about other ideas, but it's mostly for impossibilities. That fits very well. Yeah. Okay, so we have to describe our voting rules in logic somehow. And the idea is the following. We're going to use a, a, a logical language, and for that we have to fix the names of the variables. And we're going to create variables that look like this. So it's, this is a P with a subscript R and X. So for every possible profile and for every possible variable, uh, for every possible alternative, we make a variable. And so here I wrote N and the general set X, but we are um, specifically going to do this for the case of three alternatives and two voters. So we're going to create these variables. And the intuitive meaning of such a variable is that PRX is supposed to be true if and only if we elect alternative X in profile R. So such a such a atomic formula might be true for some voting rules and false for other voting rules, depending on whether we elect X in profile R under that voting rule or whether we don't uh, do so. So to make sure that you understand, let's do this exercise. So suppose we are fixing now the case of two voters and three alternatives. How many variables are there? Take a minute and a piece of paper and write down the number. So how, how big is this set? If n is two and m, the number of alternatives is three. Oh. <laughs> Any numbers that you want to shout out without explanation? Yes. 72. Okay, a, a two-digit number. Maybe. Other numbers? 36. Smaller. Nine. <laughs> 16, eight. eight. Yeah, these are all numbers. That's correct. But is, is it is any of those the numbers that I'm looking for? Bigger numbers, anyone? 118. Okay. Check your sum again. I think you have the right idea. You just made a mistake. Okay. So how do we count? What's the first thing we have to count? Well, the right. It will be. We have to, I think let's first count how many profiles there are. Let's first do how many profiles are there. So even more basic, how many preferences are there? How many ways are there for an agent to express a preference? Any number for that? Six, right? So there are three alternatives. So there are three factorial ways how I can order them, right? Six ways. So there are six preferences that one person can give us. So how many profiles are there? 36, why? Yeah, for each of the two agents, we have six choices. So it's six times six. So there are 36 profiles. So some people had 36, but this was not the final answer because there's not one variable per profile. There's one variable per pair of profile and alternative. So how many alternatives? Three. So how many variables? What do we have to do with the 36 and the three? What operation goes in the middle? 
plus minus division multiplication exactly we multiply them and then we get 108 exactly so the answer is 108 because it's 36 times 3. so that seems manageable right this is not you don't want to look at this on a piece of paper maybe but on a computer would be no problem to to say things with 108 variables um now the idea is that any way of assigning truth values to these variables saying okay, this one is true this one is false this one is also true corresponds to a choice of a voting rule corresponds to a voting rule exercise this is almost true but not quite what's the last little thing that's still wrong in this statement what why is it not exactly right what i what i wrote there how many people see that One, one winner. We need we need uh, one winner. Yes. So, what could what could what's still possible here in this scenario? Yes. So very good. So first problem is. It's still possible the rule doesn't return anything because all the variables could be false or, or all the variables for one profile could be false. And that would correspond to a rule that gives us the empty set of winners not allowed. So that's not okay. And then there's also another problem. Uh, it could also be that for a given profile, maybe two or three of the alternatives win, which is also not allowed. So we need to somehow still exclude that. And we're gonna do the exclude that on the next slide. We're going to write formulas in our logic that exclude these two problems. Let's say we only want to have truth assignments that very that satisfy these formulas that say these bad things don't happen. So the first bad thing is that nobody wins. So we don't want that. So for every profile, we want this disjunction to be true. So here I've numbered the alternatives from A1 to AM. And I say for once fixed R, the disjunction over all the M alternatives should be true. So it means at least one of these variables must be true. So that avoids the case that there is not a single winner for some profile R. And the second formula says it's, so these are, there are, there's one such formula for each profile. There are many of these formulas for every profile and for any pair of alternatives, distinct alternatives. It says, it should never be the case that you can find a profile and two alternatives such that uh, both of them are, become true. So that would mean that both of them are winners. And if I do it for every pair of alternatives, I also automatically exclude that three of them are winners. So if, if I only look at, um, at uh, cases where the conjunction of all the formulas on the slide are, is satisfied, then all the models of this formula exactly correspond to the voting rules. Right, so, so now we can say if, if this phi subscript rule is the conjunction of all these formulas, something very long, then the models of this formula are exactly the voting rules, the resolute voting rules. I'll show you one more slide and then we have a little break. So here's an example, I'm not going to do all of them, of the most complicated <coughs> axiom that we care about. So now we can write in this logic also formulas that correspond to axioms. We're going to go through it in a moment. So the idea is we have now a formula that says it must be a well-formed voting rule that's resolute. And then if we add conjunction and it must be strategy proof and it must be subjective and it must be non-dictatorial, then we have expressed in logic it must be a nice voting rule that has our properties. So let's try to understand the formula for strategy proofness. So I'm going to build a formula I call phi strategy proof. And... Okay, the exercise is to understand this, so listen to what I'm saying. There's a big conjunction, which you can read as for all, right? If I'm saying this conjunction should be true, then all its conjunct should be true. That's like a for all. So for, for every voter, for every profile R, for every other profile R prime, that is similar to R, and I'm using some ad hoc new notation here. So this is R equals subscript minus I R prime, but this I mean that this 
like R except possibly in the component of voter I. So all profile R, all profiles are prime that might differ with respect to what voter I says, but not that don't differ on anything else. For all alternatives X, for all other alternatives Y, such that voter I is one of the people who in profile R, that one, says X is better than Y. So it's a restriction over this big conjunction. Only some of the X, Ys we're going to go to, namely those that in profile R, voter I says, claims uh, that they are less good than X. So for all of these combinations of things, we want this formula to be true, which says it should not be the case that uh, in profile R, Y is elected, while also in profile R prime, X is elected. So why do I care about this? This means if this were true, if the negation were not the case, what this would mean is that if I think of R as the truthful profile and R prime as the untruthful profile, it means that um, in the truthful profile, I get Y, which truthfully I like less. And then the untruth profile, I get X, which truthfully I like more. So I have an incentive to manipulate. So that's why the negation is there. I don't want this to happen. I do not want this to happen for any X, any Y, any R, any R prime that satisfies the side constraints on the, on the board, on the slide. So I, it's a long formula, right? So this is, I've even wrote it here in general. You can then instantiate it for the case of exactly two voters and exactly three alternatives. It will be some formula. Again, you don't want to read it, but the computer can read it. And it's going to be, uh, I don't remember, I think a couple of thousands of little clauses. Uh, it's OK on the computer, but it's not nice to look at it yourself. OK, we're going to take a short break uh, until 12. And then we're going to see how to put this in the computer and run it. I, I would have made sure to quiet the room. It's fine. So, okay. So, yes, somebody is, uh, is eager to start. Me too. Um, so, any questions about what happened so far? Kind of clear what we're doing, right? So, we're writing formulas that say uh, it, this formula being true means that the underlying voting rule is well formed, always gives us a single winner, and satisfies, for example, this axiom and other ones that we could write similarly, which I'm not going to do. But you can imagine more or less what it looked like. The other ones are easier than this one. It's the most complicated axiom involved. Um, so then we can write what I call here the master formula. So we have this formula phi rule that describes it's a well-formed rule. We have this formula phi strategy proof that says it's a strategy proof rule, and we can write similar ones for subjectivity and non-dictatorship. We take the conjunction, all of them, and then that means that uh, every model of this formula, of this master formula, is basically a voting rule and vice versa. Every voting rule is a model of this formula. So we have a direct, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two things. So just for information, the way I encoded it, you could do it slightly differently, would maybe get slightly different results. We have this 108 variables that we counted before, and it's a formula of 1,445 clauses. So it's a conjunction of little disjunctions. Most of these disjunctions are quite short. There are a couple that are long, the ones that come from subjectivity. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not pretty to look at, but it's clearly possible to generate this on the computer and store it and do something with it. So this is not um, crazy big. It's big, but not crazy big. So how do you how do you represent these things on the computer? Right, You can't just write a formula directly into your computer. So there's, um, there's like a convention, a, stan a, a standard data format called the DIMAX format for doing this, for writing down a formula in conjunctive normal form. So I didn't always write my formulas so far explicitly in conjunctive normal form, but they were almost in conjunctive normal form and you can easily write them like this, just it's a bit more difficult to, um, to read. That's why I didn't do it on the slides. So conjunctive normal form, it's a, means it's a conjunction of disjunctions of literals. Literals are true and false variables, positive and negative variables. And rather than trying to write down definition, I give you just an example. 
So if I have like the propositional variables P, Q, R, and S, so the first one, the second one, the third one, and the fourth variable, and some of them are, then I, then I can represent this kind of formula as a list of lists. Each little list corresponds to one disjunction, to one clause. And I'm going to use the first natural number to refer to P, the second natural number to refer to Q, and so on. I'm going to use the positive one. If it shows up positive, I'm going to use the, neg the negation of that number if it shows up negatively. So 1 minus 2, 3 means P or not Q or R, and minus 1, 4 means not P or S, because S is the fourth propositional variable in my little list here. So that's so it's clear you can write anything you want in this format. Uh, and that's the format that's used by all the SAT solvers. There are many of these SAT solvers around. Different groups have developed them. Uh, you know, some are very, very good, and some are maybe good at certain types of input and so on. So you can use different ones. Uh, and so what, what we are still missing, what I will not do here is, is kind of the, the basic engineering work of rather than having this pretty formula on the previous slide or, or two slides back, uh, having it in this format. So you need to write a script, for example, in Python or whatever language you like, that generates these, these expressions. And that's something that anyone who, who can program would be able to do. If you explain to them, the hard part is explaining to them what these axioms mean. But once you have that figured out, it's not so difficult to write this script. Uh, so I have taught last year like a specialized course just on this topic in Amsterdam. And so here's the URL. You can find the slides there in, with much more detail. You can just copy paste the, the program. I have it only for didactic reasons. I don't put the program. I just put it on the slides so people at least still have to look at the slides before they run the program. But you know that's also good for you. And then you can copy paste it still, and it will work. And you will be able to reproduce the gibbard satisfied theorem proof. And you can change it, and you can get another thing to run, maybe, hopefully. Maybe even something interesting and something new. So I encourage you to have a look at that. Um, but it's clear that it's possible somehow. Details maybe don't matter today. And so then I have the master formula, and I can give it to the SAT solver. So here's what it looks like if you're using some Python interface to call the SAT solver. Then you first build your formula. I've got a, I call it CNF. This is a little script that generates the part of the formula that corresponds to the thing. It's a rule. This one that corresponds to its a strategy proof and so on. I make the conjunction, all of them, by concatenating these lists of lists to get a longer list of lists. I call something called solve. It takes um, milliseconds in this case, and it says unsatisfiable. And so that means the formula I gave it is not satisfiable. So the requirements that I had, it should be a well-formed rule. It should be strategy proof. It should be subjective. And it also should be non-dictatorial. The computer says impossible to do that. This form is unsatisfiable. So I have, I would say, maybe a proof of the Gibbet Satisfied Theorem for the special case of two voters and three alternatives. And now we come back to your question. Is that OK? Now, should I accept that as a proof? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say I, I would say I wouldn't use the word experiment here because the experiment I always think of as something there's like maybe a random element or like or you know we're only testing a subset of all cases and we kind of draw a graph how many times it worked or things like this that would be an experiment here we are claiming that it's an absolute thing so it's a it's right this is a this is a a formula that is satisfiable or not. Somewhere in the computer, it was constructing a proof that it was not satisfiable. It's true. It's very difficult to access. I mean, you can get it out of the computer, but then to read it is quite difficult. So that's uh, a problem. But it is 
it is claiming to be more than experiment. It is claiming to, to be a proof, but you know, is it? That's a, maybe a little bit up for debate. So I'm gonna say here now it is for the following reasons. So first of all, just a moment, let me finish this and it's your turn. Uh, first of all, I can look at my Python script that generates the formula. This is like an A4 page uh, of code for this, for this thing. Um, it's going to take you a couple of hours to understand more or less what, I'm, what I did there in my script. So you cannot just say, yeah, okay, it's fine. You would have to focus on it. But in the same way as you might spend a week to proofread a theorem in a mathematics journal and really check every step, certainly with that effort, you can also verify that the script is correct relative to the intended semantics of a Python program and relative to what I'm trying to do. So you can certainly, I think it's actually easier than reading uh, a manual proof of Gilbert Satisfy to verify that assuming the assuming Python does what it should, assuming the SAT solver does what it should, both of these are, you know, you know, you cannot be absolutely sure, but assuming these things work, I can verify the correctness of this script as well, if not better than a mathematical proof of some medium complicated result. So that I think is the case. It is true that the, the skill set of the people who are interested in these results, that you know, there's not a very big overlap with the people who are comfortable and willing to read code. So in that sense, right, you might might be easier to find a mathematician say, yeah, I'm gonna spend all week reading this proof than somebody who cares and understands social choice and also is willing to really proofread a, a program. So that's a, but that's a sociological problem, right? That's not a principal problem. So I think you can do that. So then there's still the question mark, okay, my program is correct. Will the computer execute it correctly? That's something um, I have no chance as an individual to verify. However, uh, I can run this on 15 different SAT solvers. And I can run it on 15 different SAT solvers, each produced by very reputable, reputable people who have worked on this for years or decades, who have used the, their systems and other people have used their systems and sometimes thousands of people have used their systems for all sorts of different results. So if there's a problem with SAT solver one, even if my program doesn't bring that problem to the fore, one of the other 1000 use cases of this, maybe one of them would have found the problem. So, uh, and, and you know, I, I want to get the same result with the 15 different SAT solvers, and I'm only going to be going to use SAT solvers that I'm, nobody else tells me they ever found a problem with it. And then I'm still not 100% sure, but are you 100% sure about every theorem that you find in a mathematics journal? No, obviously not. Some of them are obviously wrong. And um, the really important ones, they are probably right in most cases, but a small percentage of doubt remains for every single published result. So I would say qualitatively, therefore, there's not really such a big difference. However, you still have object. No, you were first. Yes, I will I will talk about this in a moment. Yes. I just thought you did a solver and I can remember everything, but it may be a question that here, for instance, if you have to have this open test, uh, are there hyper parameters that you need to change or uh, input into the other than the in your other Uh That's not a hyper parameter. So right now, I'm just claiming I have proven Gibbard satisfied for the special case of n equals 2 and m equals 3. I'm not claiming that's that's his question as well. So I'm not claiming the full theorem right now. I'm just claiming, claiming the little theorem for the special case. So that's all I'm doing. Last question about this. Yes. Yes, I, I don't know if it's done for such solvers, but the people bootstrap using a, a automated proof assistance or automated thing that would satisfy that the software does what we wanted. And then you just have to verify a very small piece before everything just. Into yes, so indeed, so you can also use, again, other third party software tools to verify that the SAT solver is working as it's supposed to do. So again, you can also not be 100% sure about those being true, but everything you do of this kind reduces the probability that something went wrong. Okay, so there are still um, two objections. That the first one that you mentioned, let's talk about that one first. So you only proved it for n equals two and n equals three, but the theorem is much more general. It talks about all of these cases. So two separate points. First of all, intuitively, 
um, the more voters and the more alternatives, the harder it will become to design a good voting rule. This is not completely obvious, right? Maybe there's a difference between odd and even, for example. So it might not, the difficulty of designing a voting rule might not increase monotonically, but at least, you know, intuitively, it's only going to get worse if the parameters are higher. So if I manage to prove it for this small case, I absolutely expect it to be, if not the same, worse than for the bigger cases. So intuitively, I'm almost happy. Mathematically, it's not actually so easy to generalize it. So uh, there, you can prove this, not with the SAT solver, but by hand. An inductive proof that says something like, so it's two inductions working in parallel. One says, um, if there's a rule for, uh, um, let me say it the right way around. If there's a rule for N plus one voters, then there's also one for N voters. If there's a rule for M plus one alternatives, then also for <clears throat> M alternatives. And then you read it the other way, out, way around and says, if there's none for N and M, then there's also none for the next bigger ones. And then by induction, you can go to every possible value. So this is um, intuitively, like it should obviously be the case. Mathematically, to pin it down correctly is actually surprisingly difficult. But I would say it still has value to do it like this because now we have separated the surprise element of gibbard satters weight and the routine mathematical slightly tedious argument part. The surprise element is that it breaks down even for n equals 2, m equals 3. And for that, that hard part, we use the computer. And then the boring part, to generalize it, we still use some mathematics that's maybe all, it's easier, but almost as difficult as the full gibbard satters weight theorem. But, you know, that's, yeah, we expect this to work and we make it work somehow. And I think this is important in particular if you're looking for new theorems. If you're looking for new theorems, maybe use the SAT solving technology to prove it for the special spe special small case. And you try quickly 20 different variants, slightly different axioms and so on. And you found one where it works for two and three. And maybe then you throw the computers away and you sit down by hand and you prove it by hand the full thing because then you have very strong evidence. There is an interesting result out there. It's worth your effort. But you can't invest that time for the 20 conjectures that you have. So in practice, maybe the right way of using the approach is to quickly check conjectures for small cases. If a small one works out on the computer, then say, OK, I should actually work on this seriously. And I do a traditional proof and forget about the computer program and just publish the traditional proof. I think that's a very natural way of using these ideas, just to get ideas and to confirm conjectures more or less for simple cases. And the other one that um, nobody brought up so far, in a, pr a proof is not just there to certify correctness. A proof is also there to understand. And this doesn't deliver this so far. We don't, you know, the, the computer says no, but it doesn't tell us why not. Uh, so that's a problem. There are ways around that, that I don't have time to properly talk about. There's something called minimally unsatisfiable subset of the set of clauses. So you have this, you know, thousands of clauses uh, that are unsatisfiable. But of course, if I take a subset, it probably will still be unsatisfiable. So there will be a relatively small subset that is responsible for the unsatisfiability. And there are tools to extract those. And then you can say, oh, actually, it's only really 50 of the clauses of the 1,400 that really matter. The computer tells you the real reason for the impossibility are these 50 clauses, or if you're lucky, these five clauses. And then you look at those by hand, and you just try to say, okay, I now understand where the impossibility comes from by just looking at the small subset of the stuff that's generated by the axioms. So that's that's actually a technique that doesn't work very well for Gibbard Satter's weight for reasons I don't have time to explain, but for other results, it works beautifully. So you get like a in the end, you can write down a proof by hand that's like half a column in your in your in your conference submission, and that you would have had a very hard time to find by hand. It would have been possible, probably, but it would have been really hard but the computer found it for you and you just translate it from this short subset that you found. Okay, yes. Cannot translate. Are there some axes where you cannot translate? Um, no, so uh, this proposition logic is fully expressive. You can write in it anything you want. That's the theoretically correct answer. There's also the pragmatic answer that it has to be a little bit more careful it might be really complicated. So uh, for example, it might be really hard to naturally express the axiom in CNF. And you need it in CNF, right? If you can write it in at all, you know you can always translate to CNF in theory, but in practice, it might be exponentially longer. So you might 
you might run into some practical problems that certain formats would be very big or just or just also aesthetic problems that it's like just really not a natural way of writing it down so it would be harder for the human verifier that it's correct and so on so all these pragmatic problems of course you have them but in principle everything can be written down as long as you fix the set of voters and alternatives to some finite bounds yes Sorry. if you know that you want to have a anonymity in your condition against social CRM, did you try to restrict, I mean, now your variable is you have invariance of the permutation of the, pref I mean, the preferences in the R, what is called R? Uh, yeah, the profile. The profile, yes. So you could yes. restrict your number Yes, variable. yes. So if I know that anonymity is one of my axioms, I could simplify the language, yes. And uh, similarly, in principle for neutrality, a bit more difficult, but yes, yes. But if it's not necessary, it also works without it. In some sense, it's more elegant if I don't do it because I have to do less in my own brain and I can do more on the computer. That's always a passion of the Yes, language. yes. So for our solvers, for everything that I tried, my own little script that generates the formula always takes orders of magnitudes longer than the solver that actually reasons about it. So these things are just amazing. So, right, so my thing... So this one is really easy, but I have some some work on matching, for example, where it takes a couple of minutes to run this. And 98% of that is my script to just write the formula on the computer. And 2% of it is, is, the, is the real thing that does the clever stuff. So these things are amazingly efficient. The hardest part is to generate the formula. Yes. So we'll go back to the last slide. So we have squares, so your result is on set so let's suppose that I delete the one action. So what you are going to have? If you delete one action, you will get satisfiable. So uh, so one that's, set. yes. So it's, And it will also give you a model of which you can read off fairly easily the rule that satisfies it. So you can use this by checking that the theorem cannot be strengthened by dropping any of the axiom because any one of you drop, it will give you satisfiable. It will tell you what rule is the one that satisfies it. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. And it will be, of course, it will be in a format that will not be so easy for you to read and so on. So, But in principle, the, the, the description of the rule is there. Yes, so it can be used for that stuff as well. Okay, so I'm running a bit behind time. So the second topic that I wanted to do, um, I will do briefly. Uh, I'm going to spend around 15 minutes on this, uh, on the last 10 slides. Uh, I just want to give you the basic idea of this explainability idea. So the idea that so, so far we talked about axioms. These axioms motivated certain voting rules. And then on the day we used the voting rule to produce the result. Wouldn't it be nice if we could directly reason from the axioms about the results that we want in the election to not go via the voting rule because we know the voting rules are never going to be perfect. I would like to directly refer to the axiom to explain to people why this is the right outcome. Um, uh, here's a sketch, don't have to read all of it, uh, of how you, in principle, you could do that. So um, you could say, okay, uh, here's a voting rule that returns the outcome that I want to explain. Here's the characterization theorem that says these axioms are exactly correspond to this voting rule. And then I would have an argument that actually goes from these axioms to this outcome, to this decision. So that, that might work in some very specific cases, but it's not a very generic approach because there are not so many characterization theorems that I can use. Uh, some of them involve axioms that are not so great. There are many impossibility theorems that saying certain great axioms, there is no rule and so on. So this will work in a few very specific cases, but it's not really a general approach. So I, want to like, I would like to have something more general. And when defining it to you, I will show you an example of what a system might do that can explain decisions. So I have here a profile. There are three voters and three alternatives. The alternatives are square, triangle, and circle. We have this profile. We can think about what would be a good outcome. Let's first think in the, in the traditional way. So what, let's say I want the square to win. What would be a voting rule that makes the square win? Can anyone give me an example of a voting rule that makes the square win? Yes, in the back. Plurality, yes. So the square shows up most often in the top position. So that was an easy exercise. So let's make it a bit harder. Give me a voting rule that would make the triangle win. Yes, same. Some 
some version of border with different weights. So some other position is going with concrete example. Yes, the veto rule. Yeah, the anti plurality rule. So the one which is the one one zero version. So the triangle is the only one that never shows up in the end position. So it would win, win under this rule. So. So we have already two outcomes that might be elected by certain non-crazy voting rules. So um, what if I now don't want to look at a specific, don't want to settle on a specific voting rule, but I still want to give an argument about, look, this would be a good outcome. And I just want to argue in terms of axioms, not in terms of voting rules. How could I do that? So in this example, the names of the axioms that are involved that are involved, they are not axioms I have defined yesterday, but I will um, explain them you know, on the fly, and they're all reasonably convincing. So I have this profile. Suppose I first look at this sub-profile where only one voter votes, the first one. Uh, and she says the square is the best, so obviously we should elect the square. There is actually an axiom that says that. It's called faithfulness. It says if there's only one voter, do what she's asking for. I think you cannot argue with that, right? That's very, very convincing. Now let's look at the second sub-profile at the bottom. So there are two voters, uh, and they have kind of exactly opposing preferences. So uh, circle, triangle, square, circle, triangle, square, the other way around. So then there's something called the cancellation axiom that says, if there's such a situation where every single pairwise comparison comes out as a tie, how are you going to decide? The only thing you could possibly do is say, okay, everybody wins. So, like, there's a tie between all outcomes. Convinced? I think it's it's harder to convince somebody of that than the previous step. The previous step, like, there's no way you can argue with that. This one, I think you can argue with that a little bit. But it's an axiom that's in the literature that some people say is a good one, and some people say, oh, I don't completely like it. But you can use it as an argument, right? It's not It's not a bad argument. You might have a better argument, but it's not a crazy argument. So I'm going to use it. I'm going to say yes, because of this cancellation thing, because of this strong symmetry in the input, the only thing I can do is say everybody wins. And then the last step is I'm going to combine the two profiles again. And I'm going to say, um, well, in the first sub profile, let's say in the second sub profile, everybody was winning. In the first sub profile, only the, the square was winning. So I should think of this first voter as breaking the tie that was generated by the rest of the population. Formally, this is known as the reinforcement axiom, or sometimes also known as the consistency axiom, which says that I take two populations, I apply the voting rule on each of them separately, in case the, re and it's irresolute rules, in case these sets of winners overlap, then if I ask the full population for their preferences, the elements in the intersection should be winning. And this is a special, particularly convincing case of that, right? So I think the better way of, of saying it is like, if all but the first one vote, there's a full tie, we add the first one, she should be allowed to break that tie, so we're only gonna elect the square. So now this is what I would call a justification or an explanation for why only square winning is a good outcome for this profile. I've never talked about the voting rule, I've only talked about basic normative principles about axioms. You can attack these axioms. You might not like each of these axioms. The weakest step is cancellation, I would say. But if you do that, you have to engage with these normative arguments. You have to say, oh, I don't like this normative argument because of blah. And you don't just say, oh, I don't like this outcome. I don't like your rule, which is too complicated. I don't understand it. You have to focus on the argument. And then if you do that, maybe I'll have another argument that I can show. I don't have anything prepared now, but there might be another derivation that gives it as well, which uses slightly different axioms. Maybe you find that more convincing. Or maybe you come back to me and say, oh, look, I have a derivation for the triangle to win. And then I don't have, then we don't talk about square versus triangle. We talk about the concrete arguments that derived it. And we don't talk about the full line of the argument, but we maybe agree on most of it. And there's just one step that we disagree on. We just talk about that one. So I think that, that's the, that's the nice thing about this, that it allows us to focus on the reasons why we make certain choices. And uh, you know, maybe we will not agree in the end, but we can at least understand which exact part we have a problem with. Um, so very briefly, I think, 
I'll skip that and I'll try to explain the definition without uh, all the notation in place. I think it's going to work. So I want to give you a sketch of a formal definition of what I just shown you of what it would mean to justify an outcome for a profile. And so we have, we are given as input an outcome X star, which is a, a subset of the uh, of the alternative. So now there, there could be a tie in this situation. It doesn't have to be a single winner. Uh, and we have a profile R star submitted by a population, an electorate N star. So this is my input. And, and, I'm, and also I'm getting a long list of axioms that I'm allowed to use. I'm calling this the corpus. Uh, many axioms that together will be highly, highly, highly inconsistent. But I'm, use, I'm allowed to use some of these axioms to try to give an to construct an argument why is X star a good outcome in profile R star? And this I call a justification. And our slogan here is that the justification is a normative basis together with an explanation. The normative basis is a subset of the art of the um, axioms that I'm given. So these are the specific three axioms, let's say, that I'm actually using. And the explanation is kind of a step-by-step -step explanation, like I've shown you graphically on the previous few slides, how these axioms force that outcome. And, and this explanation, the basic ingredients of this explanation are what we call instances of the axiom. So, you know, Pareto is a very general axiom, but then there's the instance of Pareto that talks about this one profile and why it should not win. And it's just talking about locally about that and not about everything else at the same time. So then a justification is a pair of a normative basis and an explanation. Normative basis, set of axioms. Explanation, set of instances of these axioms that satisfies these four properties. The first property, adequacy, says in your normative basis, only use axioms in the corpus. Don't just invent an axiom. Use something that you know, has been vetted as being okay to use as an argument. Relevance says the little axiom instances showing up in the explanation, there must be instances of the axioms that you've chosen in your normative basis. Don't just suddenly talk about something else and what you said, these are the arguments I'm going to use. So these are very basic. The, the, the core is explanatoriness. Uh, it says that um, if I'm looking at the axiom instances in the explanation, then every voting rule that satisfies all of the instances of these axioms should in profile R star elect outcome X star. So every voting rule that is consistent with the instances that I've decided to focus on must give the outcome that I want, give, want to have. And it also should be so in a minimal sense, if I remove even a single one of the axiom instances, it should not be logically strong enough anymore to get the same outcome. So then suddenly, you know, there could be more than one outcome that's possible. So I can't say anything in general anymore. And the last step is non-triviality. This one says that you're not allowed to use axioms that are part of an impossibility theorem, basically. So don't you, yeah, if you use the axioms of gilbert satters weight, I can do, any, I can prove anything with those, right? So I get the contradiction and from a contradiction, I can say, tomorrow it's going to rain, and this will be a correct inference, a logical inference, but not a very useful one, right? So you have to, in the last set, to step check that the axioms that you're using actually make sense, and they're not too strong. They're just about strong enough to do what we want to do. So that's what we call an explanation. Uh, it's useful in many circumstances. So one would be, we have used uh, the border rule, for example. We got the square, but I can't co go out to the people and say, look, it's the border rule. That's why we why it's winning, because they don't trust me that the border rule, you know, I just made it up to, because it's good for me or something like this. Instead, I show them the explanation I've shown you before. I can convince people it's actually a fair decision. Next scenario that we might use is deliberation support. So they are, we are here sitting in the room. We're trying to figure out whether A, B, or C is the best thing to do tomorrow. It's very difficult for us to figure out. Um, we have different opinions initially, but we are friends. We're trying to find the right answer. We could use this explanation stuff to suppose we were to vote now, what outcomes can we generate an explanation for? Using different arguments we can use, we can justify different outcomes. And then in the next step, we don't continue arguing just about the outcomes, but the outcomes together with the explanation supporting them. And then you can say, oh, I like A, but not just because I like A, but I also like the argument that led to it. And then maybe I can convince you more easily than if I just say A is wonderful. 
And the last uh, idea is we can use it directly for voting. There's no voting rule specified at all, but we just have these axiom sets and we say, well, the justification generation would say this is the outcome. So let's accept it as the outcome of the, of the voting rule that it hasn't even been uh, put on paper. Uh, gonna skip that as well. So the, um, the nice thing is that, so this is complicated obviously, but it can be implemented and it can be implemented with the SAT solver. So um, there's also a satisfiability task here, right? So if I write down the axiom instances that I care about, and then the negation of the thing that I want to prove. So I say, oh, in profile Rx, x star is not winning. I write that as a little formula. If that set becomes unsatisfiable, then it means that if I want this and this and this axiom instance to be true, I must elect the outcome that I care about. So I can reduce the task of figuring out whether my outcome is forced by the axiom to a satisfiability question. So I can use the SAT solver. And I can use the MUS extractor that I talked very briefly about of getting a kind of an explanation of where the unsatisfiability comes from, exactly to generate these kind of explanations that I've shown you in a, in a fancy format. And we have, uh, so this is implemented. It works for, for small scenarios. It works very well. Uh, and you have the slides. You will, you will see the, the URL there where you can make a little pro preference profile. You can decide, I think I want the justification for this outcome. I'm happy you to use these axioms. You click which ones you like, and it tries to construct an argument why this would be a good uh, outcome without ever talking about the voting rule. It just says from axioms to outcomes. Okay, to summarize. Um, what I did in the first part, a bit more than the first part today, is I was trying to show you how we can use SAT solvers to reason about voting scenarios, about social choice scenarios, very specifically to get proofs for impossibility theorems, but in the questions that already came up, we can also you know, check that it's actually possible. We can maybe extract the rule that makes it possible. So we can also use this a bit more generally. 90% of the published work of this kind is about impossibility results, more than 90%, I think. So it's still awaiting people to do something more with it, but it's clear that there's potential. Uh, so I think this is a very, very exciting direction. It's um, it's not so easy because it requires some formal skills in classical social choice and some pragmatic skills, writing a Python script and not being scared of that. Uh, and the people, the few people in the world who have kind of managed to put these two things together by investing a few weeks to usually learn the Python part that they had trouble with before, that was the, this, the, for me the case, uh, they have been able to get quite a nice number of results out of that. Um, that not so many other people have managed. And so if you look at this Amsam course that I told you about, I try to make it very, very easy for people to pick that up. And it worked somewhat with my own students so far that in a relatively short time, we managed to get some interesting uh, results. And then briefly in the second part, I talked about this idea of justifying or explaining outcomes by directly going from the axioms to the outcomes. And I think this is a much more general idea and I've only presented the uh, approach from my own group, uh, how we're doing this. And in our approach, we're doing it with SAT solvers, but there absolutely are other ways that you could try to do that or how you could change a bit the definition of what you mean by an explanation. So this is absolutely not settled in stone right now. And we are also still moving a little bit every now and then about what we think about this exactly. But as a topic, I think it's very, very interesting. Like you're using some kind of social choice mechanism to take a decision. How do you justify to people that you took this decision rather than the other one? Um, and you know, what does that mean exactly? I think there's a lot of interesting conceptual work to be done, lots of mathematical work to prove theorems about it, lots of very pragmatic work to get it to run in practice. And I think all of this is very uh, interesting and promising. Okay, so this is uh, what I wanted to talk about. I will just announce that um, uh, I think so the stuff that Aurelie is talking about the uh, fair division, I would also count this under computational social choice, slightly different topic. So this afternoon, there will be some live experiments that Aurelie and I think Jerome will run with you. So good luck with that. I think it will be fine. It will be nice. And then uh, tomorrow, Jerome will teach another lecture on computational social choice. And he has lots of ideas of what he could do. Um, if we don't stop him, we will talk about all of them. And I think that would be a bit too much, so you have to vote. You have to you have to vote what you want to do, and I put the the address here, and you have to vote by the end of lunch, I think. Okay.
I put it here. So bit.ly vote dash P for the name of the place. There you get the, the form where you can vote between, I don't know, eight hot topics in social choice. You can also, if you say, oh, I want to do this other thing, please prepare a slide set for tomorrow on this other topic. You can also put that there as a new as a new alternative. So <laughs> he will promise to do his best, I understand. So thank you very much for your attention.